Welcome. This lecture is on the Roaring Twenties. The so-called war collectivism of World War I that saw the alliance of big business and big government controlling the economy ended after the war. The Twenties witnessed a return to the free market and less government approach of the past. With less government involvement in the economy, the American people enjoyed a flood of productivity that raised their standard of living dramatically. The following summary by economists Milton Friedman and Anna Jacobson Swartz is helpful. The 20s were, in the main, a period of high prosperity and stable economic growth. An enormous construction boom rebuilt American cities. The automobile reshaped American life. The bull market in stocks mirrored soaring American optimism about the war, about the future. <clears throat> From 1921 to 1929, two recessions interrupted economic development, but both were so mild that many, if not most, of those who lived and worked at the time were unaware that they had occurred. Republican Warren Harding won the presidential election of 1920, defeating Democrat James Cox. Harding had the misfortune of choosing appointees who were involved in political scandal. Before he learned the extent of the shadiness, he died of a cerebral hemorrhage on August the 2nd, 1923. Calvin Coolidge, the vice president, became president and he easily defeated his opponents in the 1924 presidential election. Coolidge championed the free market and was wary of socialist ideas. The Republican party remained popular with voters throughout the night throughout the 1920s. Although 1920 was not a banner year economically, there was recovery the following year. Private industry made major gains, thus providing a high level of employment. Industrial trends of the decade saw more mass production and standardization of consumer goods, improved sources of power, new machines and tools, and increased output per man hour. At the beginning of the decade, the population of the United States was almost 107 million, 107 million, and 10 years later, it was 123 million. In the 1920s, on a per capita basis, the gross national product of the United States increased in constant dollars by approximately 20%. Manufacturers utilize more automatic and semi-automatic machinery, saving both time and labor. There was a huge increase in the use of electric power. Electric energy for industry doubled. The volume of manufacturing rose almost 40% from 1919 to 1929. An important factor was the major advance of technology. There were more patents issued in the 1920s than any previous decade. Earlier inventions such as the automobile, tractor, radio, and airplane became commonplace. To keep pace with the vehicles and machinery, petroleum production increased from 443 million in 1920 to more than 1 billion barrels a year in 1929. The auto bu business became the nation's largest industry employing over 5% of wage earners. Motor vehicle registration increased from one and a quarter million in 1913 to over 26 
million by 1929. By the end of the decade, there was an average of nearly one vehicle per family. Mass production drove prices down. In 1924, Americans could buy the Model T Ford touring car for $300 or the Chevrolet Roadster for $500. By 1926, most cars, as much as 70%, were sold on the installment plan, which became more common for many retail sales. In the automotive business, tough competition and subsequent concentration resulted in Ford, General Motors, and the Chrysler Corporation dominating the market. The automobile industry spurred other businesses. When more automobiles be became closed cars, the glass industry took off. The automobile industry took about 15% of the nation's steel production. Rubber, gasoline, lead, leather, and many other industries profited from extensive automobile manufacturing. At the end of the decade, there were more than 54,000 garages serving customers. The mileage of surface roads increased 80%. There was great demand for new homes and the housing industry blossom, particularly in the suburbs. A novelty at the beginning of the decade, mechanical refrigerator production reached 900,000 in the year 1929. In 1921, there had only been 5,000 manufactured. Production of radios went from almost 200,000 in 1923 to nearly 5 million in 1929. Americans loved their telephones. And by 1929, there was one telephone for every 2.5 residences. The American Telephone and Telegraph Company became the largest corporation in the United States with assets totaling 4.2 billion. Americans ate healthier, including more fruits, vegetables, and food processed by better sanitary operations. Life was better. Stationary bathtubs and electricity were among important conveniences that many ordinary Americans experienced. For the first time in their history, many ordinary people had free time on, hand, on their hands and used it to enjoy themselves. Professional sports attracted large crowds, in 1923, Yankee Stadium was built. The builders transformed 10 acres of unused Bronx land into the largest baseball park in America. The stadium stretched 700 feet apart at its widest, and 2 million board feet of lumber was necessary for the bleachers and concrete forms. A welcome feature for fans were wide aisles, wide seats, ample room between the seats, the rows of seats, and 16 toilet rooms, eight for each sex. The completed stadium cost about 2.5 million and took 11 months to build. Yankee Stadium was symbolic of the good times of the 1920s. Americans also flocked to football games, movies, uh, concerts. However, the extra leisure time was not all positive. For some, 
It was an era of raucous parties and bootleg liquor. In literary circles, modern artists and writers were the lost generation who challenged traditional values. And with the speak easy, the name is referring to these underground bars where you could get alcohol, served alcohol, but speakeasy was in essence to speak quiet and not arouse uh, too much attention because this, these, um, these sites were illegal during prohibition, prohibition. On the darkest side, there was a resurgence of the KKK in the early 1920s. It, uh, the Ku Klux Klan had a membership of 4.5 million in 1924. Fortunately, it was in decline by 1925 and its membership virtually disappeared soon after. Historian Alice Hawley argues that many Americans sought heroic figures who perform great feats while upholding traditional ideals and values. The greatest media, media hero of the 1920s was Charles Lindbergh, whose solo flight across the Atlantic Ocean became the most sensational event of the decade. Lindbergh, a former stunt flyer, worked as a mail flyer delivering mail from St. Louis to Chicago. Learning of a $25,000 prize for the first successful flight from New York to Paris, Lindbergh purchased a monoplane with a 223 horsepower motor that he named the Spirit of St. Louis. He left Long Island on May 20th, 1927 and arrived in Paris 33 hours and 30 minutes later. Lindbergh became an instant hero. Historian John William Ward asked, quote, was the flight the achievement of a heroic, solitary, unaided individual, or did the flight represent the triumph of the machine? the success of an industrially organized society, end of quote. There were also questions about American culture in the 1920s, federal politics and the economy leaned conservative and progressives who shaped much of the previous decade lost political sway. But Progressives did make their mark in the churches. Traditional Protestants mostly focus on soul winning and defending a literal understanding of the Bible. In time, however, conservative Protestants, which includes fundamentalists, felt the need to engage in issues that they believed hurt American society. And the term fundamentalist came out of a collection of articles that were written between 1910 and 1915, offering a alternative perspective to the modernist liberal uh, approach of, um, of a number of clergy. And, Basically, the fundamentals were that the, these people believed in the inspiration and inerrancy of scripture, the virgin birth of Jesus, Christ's death as the atonement for sin, bodily resurrection of Jesus, historical reality, the miracles of Jesus, and, and other things. Uh, basically, you're just your old traditional, old fashioned uh, gospel message, but that was being challenged by clergy professors who were adopting a, a modernist approach 
that question some of the fundamentals. The rise of revolutionary socialism compelled some fundamentalist Christians to be more political. In the wake of the Russian Revolution of 1917, when Bolshevik leaders murdered many Russian citizens not compliant to socialist policies, some American church leaders believed it was their duty to point to the chaos caused by socialism. After World War I, there was a Red Scare in America, and one fundamentalist publication was The King's Business. And they warned of socialism. There was actually in the June 1919 issue, an illustration showing a cloud of Bolshevism and a pack of wolves bearing down on a man behind a fence with labels such as higher criticism and social service. In capital letters, the key question was, will this fence hold them back? So will higher criticism and social service, will modernist theology be able to hold back socialism? Revolutionary socialism revealed, according to writers in the King's business, quote, the full power of the God of this age, Satan. Liberal Protestants did not show the same degree of concern for socialism as did the literal Bible-believing Protestants. Liberals increasingly viewed fundamentalists as a misguided group who failed to see the wisdom of a post-millennial view and evidence of world progress. Fundamentalists argued that it was false liberal doctrine that was behind societal chaos. The gap between conservatives and liberals became more obvious with the rise of separatist movements and groups. The formation of the World's Christian Fundamentals Association was one such group organized to expose modernism. Its first conference was in May 1919. Baptists from the Northern Baptist Convention put together a fundamentals conference to clarify how far liberals had strayed from orthodox theology. Fundamentalists and liberals lined up on opposing sides on many issues, including America's position on the League of Nations. The League of Nations came out of World War I consistent with the idea of a new era of world politics. The foundation of the league was President Woodwell Wilson's sense of idealism that was expressed in his 14 points. At the Treaty of Paris, that is the Treaty of Versailles, Wilson had high hopes for his visionary idea of a league of nations for solving international disputes peacefully. He had faith in a global leadership but he was unable to get the necessary support from Congress. After Republicans failed to support American entry into the League of Nations, Wilson campaigned across the country to, pro to promote the treaty and his pro-League measure, telling the American people that opponents of the treaty were traitors to humanity. Halfway in his 8,000 mile speaking tour, Wilson collapsed and a few days later had a stroke that made him a virtual invalid. The support that liberal Christians gave to the League of Nations confirmed to fundamentalists that the League was a bad idea. Fundamentalism, fundamentalists traced the League to modernist liberal theology. Dispensationalists, a subgroup of fundamentalism, were especially on guard for the emergence of anti-Christian world empire. Other fundamentalists likewise were suspicious of claims that there could be world peace by way of global organizations. Some argue that America's failure to join the League of Nations was the first major political victory for fundamentalists. 
However, fundamentalists remain mostly on the defensive since mo moderate, um, the modernists increasingly took control of key leadership positions in the major denominations. Almost all mainstream Protestant denominations supported the League of Nations. The Federal Council of the Churches of Christ not only endorsed the League, but also pressured recalcitrant politicians to support the League. The, count, the Federal Council of the Churches of Christ represented 33 Protestant denominations. Uh, it was known for its uh, social activism. Its increasing adoption of modern theology was a red flag for the more traditional conservative Protestant slash fundamentalists. Fundamentalists also saw a problem with modernist education in the 1920s, notably the teaching of Darwinism in the classroom. Most Americans believed in the divine creation of mankind and much of the early debates concerning Darwin, Darwin were confi confined to scholarly circles. When these dis debates spilled over into the public arena, fundamentalists responded with concern. In his 1922 sermon, liberal Baptist preacher Harry Emerson Fosdick asked, shall the fundamentalists win? Conservative Clarence McCartney responded with, shall unbelief win? Liberals rejected any pressure to uphold the inerrancy of scripture. What followed was, was that almost all of the large Protestant denominations experienced disruption. However, it is the monkey trial of 1925 that continues to capture the attention of many. There was much at stake. Many Bible-believing Christians had equated Darwinism with atheism. So what was the monkey trial of 1925? Well, in that year, the Tennessee legislature passed a bill that made it unlawful to teach the theory of evolution in the classroom. Such a law was not uncommon in the United States. Certainly there were many other states besides Tennessee that had similar law. The American Civil Liberties Union, that is the ACLU, advertised in Tennessee newspapers for a teacher to volunteer as a defendant to challenge the Tennessee law. A businessman in the small town of Dayton saw this issue as a publicity opportunity to boost the town's economy. Others agreed. The next step was to approach a high school biology teacher well, it was they couldn't actually find a biology teacher who would teach this. So when at this school, when the biology teacher refused, John Thomas Scopes, the physics teacher, accepted the challenge. He substituted for the biology teacher and taught a class. There was a formal arrest and the ACLU began its case with Clarence Darrow as the defending lawyer. Darrow was famous for successfully defending the lives of two cold-blooded child killers in the Leopold and Loeb trial of the previous year. The ACLU supplied two other eminent lawyers of the day. They desired to show the superiority of modern thinking contrast to biblical thinking. By introducing expert scientific testimony, the defense, quote, hoped to use the trial to prove the theory of evolution before the courts, before the courts and the American public. 
The judge, however, ruled that Scopes was on trial, not science and religion. Representing the Tennessee law was William Jennings Bryan, who had run for president three times without success. Bryan was a Presbyterian who championed Christianity as a force of good in civilization. A foe of evolutionism, Bryan volunteered his services to the prosecution, even though he at the time was suffering with uh, diabetes and poor health. For about the past 10 years, Brian had become increasingly worried about the negative influence of evolutionary thinking. Brian's wife reported that he became convinced that the teaching of evolution as a fact instead of a theory caused the students to lose faith in the Bible, first in the story of creation and later in other doctrines which underlie the Christian religion. During World War I, Brian saw the darkest side of human nature and he blamed evolutionary ideas for German militarism. Brian was no Bible scholar, but in 1920, he began attacking evolution seriously at college campuses. Two years later at the University of Wisconsin, he caused an uproar when he denounced evolution. The president of the university was furious, and the two had harsh words for each other for over a year. Brian wrote anti-evolution articles for the New York Times and various publications. And there were others who were doing this too. At the Scopes trial, the defense did not care to prove Scopes' innocence. It looked forward to appealing a guilty verdict to the Supreme Court. The showdown between Brian and Darrow turned out to be a bizarre episode. Brian agreed to be questioned on the witness stand by Darrow, who opposed Brian's ignorance, or sorry, who exposed, exposed Brian's ignorance of the Bible. The media portrayed Brian as a stumbling, confused man. Several days after his participation in the trial, he died of a stroke at the age of 75. The jury did find Scopes guilty and he received a fine of $100. However, on a technicality, the Tennessee Supreme Court threw the case out. Foiled by this outcome, the ALCU and the evolutionists were upset. However, the liberal media turned the episode into a victory for modernism. Subsequent counts included extort included distortions of the event by assuming that Scopes was a biology teacher, that the town of Dayton was a backyard and thoroughly anti-evolutionist, and that Brian's death directly resulted from the trial. Intellectuals saw the case as a battle of light versus dark. More specific, the myth was that the new conquered the old, quote, modern, modernity conquered fundamentalism and the underdog triumphs, end of quote. In the eyes of progressives, a young modern scopes with the aid of an urban lawyer had defeated outdated conservative forces. In many newspaper accounts, Scopes emerge as a young, shy, incorruptible hero of American free thinkers. A man, quote, defending his beliefs in the face of a hostile anti-evolutionist climate, end quote. The press created the image 
that he, quote, did not seek the limelight and was bewildered by the attention the trial had received. The New York Times reported that the virtuous scope turned down offers that added up to $150,000. As it turns out, the New York Times had it wrong. This was false. There was no such offers. But the press was powerful, and it had it was had significant um, impact in swaying the opinion of many. In contrast, Brian was old and absurd. George Bernard Shaw wrote, quote, that people who no conception, who have no conception of evolution have no future, no hope, end of quote. For him, fundamentalism was, quote, infantilism. The media portrayed Dayton as home to religious fanatics, to ignorant and backyard people. Darrow, in this narrative was the brilliant agnostic. He had claimed that the Tennessee law was un-American and unconstitutional. It attempted to limit the human mind's inquiry, inquiry after truth. Since the Scopes trial, liberal intellectuals have argued that the evolutionists were victorious. An opposing and less popular interpretation in history books is that Scopes was a foolish man conned into a publicity stunt that went wrong. Historian Marwin Woods writes that Scopes, quote, enters the trial to aid money-grubbing enterprising boosters willing to sacrifice their community's reputation and the fate of a young man to make cash. Darrow comes to Dayton to end democracy and force upon the people of Tennessee ideas they considered foreign, dangerous, and subversive." End of quote. In the end, the, the so-called sophisticated lawyers and journalists had won the day for modernism. Fundamentalists continued to believe in the fundamentals of Christianity, including the errancy of the Bible. What did change was that liberals became confident that a literal reading of the Bible had no standing in the modern world. Okay, the conclusion of the lecture. Throughout the 1920s, conservative economic thinking won the day. Gone was the heavy involvement of government in the economy that took place during World War I. The progressive era was over. There were politicians who wanted greater economic planning control by the government, but President Calvin Coolidge administration favored government's limited role. It was a decade of prosperity. Some regions benefited more than others, but generally life was better for all Americans. Although progressives lost ground in political and economic circles, they gained ground in church circles. Mainstream church leadership began to distance themselves from a literal interpretation of the Bible and a gospel message of sin and salvation. Thank you.